And thanks to all of you for, for being here. Um, well, I'll ask some questions now, and you all can ask some questions uh, in, a little, in a little bit, I guess. Um, I was going to ask you first to give us an overview of Night Film, but we've seen the trailer. Um, so I, that's, that's some of it. Is there any way that you'd sort of expand on that to give people a sense of what's of going on in the book? Um, Night Film is a psychological thriller about three strangers coming together in contemporary New York to investigate a young woman's death. Um, her father just so happens to be this very controversial figure who's responsible for some of the most terrifying films ever made. So as this band of outsiders forms, these strangers come together, um, they begin to inch closer and closer to not only what happened to this young woman who turned up dead at the bottom of a Chinatown warehouse at 24, but they come closer and closer to unmasking the identity of her father and what basically this family's history is. Um, out of curiosity, when, when you're working on a project like this, um, I'm sure people ask you a lot, what is it about? Do you have a pitch like that, sort of ready to go for people? Well, I think, <laughs> I have thought, I mean, I think very much during the creative process, you're not exactly sure what it's about. So, of course, like when um, your editor asks you to write jacket copy, you actually have to boil things down and take a step back. But that's absolutely after the creative process. And I like to not pigeonhole what I'm doing in terms of any kind of genre or theme and really just focus on character and what the journey is and then of course like um, being able to discuss it in a, a more cocktail party setting yeah, yeah. Um, is helpful um, <laughs> okay. so it's nice to to have a take on it at that point but yeah. obviously when you're writing it I think that you just have to keep an open mind and not try to pigeonhole yourself okay okay um, so I know uh, from talking to you earlier that, that you, the genesis of this was thinking up Cordova. Exactly, Do you yes. remember a particular moment when that, that notion, that character sort of gelled in your head or clicked into place? Well, I think, and I might have mentioned this to you before, um, I think there were two moments. One was I happened to be in Paris promoting Special Topics, my first novel, and I was wandering the streets. I had a bit of downtime, and I happened upon Christie's auction house, and there was this very strange figure in the process of leaving and he was surrounded by handlers and he happened to be wearing a pair of glasses that were very round as if his eyes weren't actually there. I was standing quite at quite a distance so there's something very arresting about his figure and he was accompanied by a young woman who appeared to be his daughter but then I wasn't actually sure it could have been his girlfriend at the same time and then there were all these handlers surrounding them and there was something about the way that they controlled the environment around them and controlled the street corner and then dissolved they emer they entered this chauffeured car and drove off and yet there were still reverberations of their presence even swirling outside of the auction house and the way all these other handlers were speaking and then it all sort of dissolved and there was a moment of real gravity with these characters. So just the image of that stayed in my mind. So when I was later doing a bit of research in terms of directors and auteurs and what it means to make a film or to tell a story and to bring people into your orbit for a consolidated period of time. So everyone has this very concentrated experience away from the here and now. Um, and then they go back to their lives. Those two aspects merged and became Cordova. Okay. okay. I should ask you about the, the period of time that you spent studying film. Um, yes. After you had sort of finished um, you know, the publication and promotion and touring and all that for special topics, you took some film classes. I did. I enrolled in an NYFA class, New York Film Academy, which is located just at uh, Union Square, and took a two-month filmmaking class, really starting at a very grassroots level with a 16 millimeter camera, and then working up to sync sound and, um, and just having projects that we, we would have to go out and make films in two, three day, this very, uh, consolidated a period of time where we basically got no sleep. And it was just another way to learn to tell stories. And I think having come off the promotion of special topics, I wanted to reset and go back to basics in a certain way before I started off on my second book. Okay, so you, so you didn't have any particular sense that this, um, 
that taking these classes and getting these knowledge, getting this knowledge would sort of lead into something, another project. I'm not ruling it out, of course, but I'm not <laughs> quitting my day job anytime soon either. I think um, it was nice to try telling stories in a different format. And of course, everything that I learned from the course obviously pervaded night film in many ways in terms of the establishment of this director and um, what it means to make a film, what it means to make art, and the idea that people will give their lives over to the control of this patriarchal, patriarchal figure, the director, and, um, and have this experience. Okay. Uh, what what films uh, in our world would you say seem uh, closest to you to, to what you imagine a Cordova film being like? I think it would be early Polanski, like Knife in the Water and Repulsion, um, more psychological thrillers versus outright horror movies like Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Halloween. Um, I think that Cordova's horror comes from what is unseen and a dark twist that get deeper and deeper and um, I was very inspired by repulsion and I remember hearing some professor in a film theory class talk about the director's eye that's the camera and in Repulsion, the camera moves at such a glacial pace at times. And in the beginning of the movie, as it drifts through this young woman's apartment that she shares with her sister, um, each object that the camera drifts over takes on a real weight. So by the end of the film, when the camera is doing the same sinuous snaking through the apartment, you see how um, the apartment has become absolutely destroyed, and it's very much paralleling her mental state into madness. Um, so I think that was really a jumping off point in terms of Cordova, this eye that really is all seeing, and, um, and how haunting that can be. Um, you know, I imagine a lot of people here are great fans of special topics. Um, right. And I can imagine some people reading Night Film and feeling this is a very different book or a, an attempt to do a very different thing than special topics did. I can imagine other people reading it and sort of feeling like this is very much of a piece. It's definitely the same author. I'm yes. curious how different they feel to you. They feel entirely in the same universe. I think that special topics also dealt with the dark underbelly that exists between what appears normal and what appears suburban and tranquil. And Night Film also deals with those dark recesses that exist in our modern world. But I think Night Film goes much deeper, may, may, quite overtly, into those dark recesses. While with special topics, it's really refracted through this young woman's experience. And she really has no idea what's going on underneath the surface of this world around her. Um, while Night Film certainly plunges absolutely uh, wholeheartedly into those dark tunnels. Um, but for me, they're related. I mean, they're siblings, or maybe they're cousins. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I imagine a lot of people would have expected your second book to maybe be um, sort of bidding for a kind of um, literary esteem or something like that. Um, okay. Whereas this uh, seems to shoot for, for real crowd-pleasing and to give people a, a sort of a, an, an experience that's maybe even a little escapist and mm -hmm. has that sort of fun to it. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious <laughs> your reaction to that. I wasn't trying to do a question. Um, this, I but. think that I approach writing in terms of what I want to read. And I th at the moment, um, 2008, 2009, when I set out writing Night Film, I wanted to find a multi-layered story that had a lot of twists and turns that was dark, that would take me on a, a journey, but also have an element of fun and enthusiasm. So I really came at it from that perspective as a reader. Um, but I didn't really, I don't think in terms of what critics are going to say or how I'm going to be pigeonholed, literary or non-literary. I mean, I think if you're always if you have that sort of self-consciousness, then you're not absolutely in the story and you're not following your gut. So um, from that perspective, I wanted to create a dark odyssey with characters on the periphery of society coming together and, and seeking a, a central truth. So I started with really that conceit and then everything took off from there. Okay. Well, can we talk a little bit about the difference uh, in the, the writing process between the two of them? Sure, Because I absolutely. understand it was... Uh, fairly different the way that you went about sort of uh, plotting and, and uh, creating this book versus the first one. 
Yes, I think when you're writing your first novel, there's such a sense of newness and the belief that you've never done this before, so you want as much scaffolding holding you in place as possible. And so I uh, had Excel spreadsheets and I had really very rationally mapped out what each twist and turn would be, exactly where all of my characters were going, what my uh, what my main character knew versus what was actually going on. Um, but as you write more books, I would think, I mean, I'm only on my second, but um, you just need less scaffolding and you're more willing to free fall and take jumps and to scale with nothing holding you in place and really see what that exploration is and what you find. Because often, if you allow yourself not to know and to be comfortable with not knowing how things are going to end up, then you, I think that you reach a more interesting conclusion than if you had just rationally figured it out. So Night Film just had that, that writing process was much more dislocating. And I think given the material, given that it was going to some very dark places, uh, I, I just wanted that sense of dislocation in myself as a writer. But... I have talked to other writers who are on their seventh, eighth books, and they tell me that each book has its own way of being written and its own set of directions. And as long as you show up and are open to not knowing, then um, you can just allow that process to really inform you, and then it translates into the book. Okay. I mean, did you find it pleasurable or challenging to sort of jump into this one without, um, without so much scaffolding? Pleasurable in the sense of being terrified, but just continuing to move. I mean, I think there were moments where I had seen a documentary about Everest where one of the mountain climbers had fallen down a crevasse. And I think he was like half a mile down into the earth. And the only thing that saved his life was just to keep making decisions. And I definitely feel that way as a writer. And that he said that that kept him mentally in place, that as long as he was making decisions, they might be the wrong decision. But as long as you're moving forward, you're, you're getting somewhere. So even having that sense of dislocation, just making decisions about the narrative, making decisions about my characters, just moving forward, I could always go back and change. And that's how I dealt with not having that scaffolding. So <laughs> it was like ice climbing, basically. Um, I should probably talk more about things in the book. I don't know if I have any questions ready about that, but um, oh. I'm curious, what, are there any sort of, were any parts of it particularly pleasurable to write? I don't know if I can ask that without spoiling anything, but I'm, I'm curious. For me, it's much easier as a writer to write internal histories and to, internal histories in terms of what might have happened in the past. Um, for example, there's a chapter that's devoted to entirely to two warring sisters who are both actresses. I was obviously inspired by Olivia de Havilland and Joan Fontaine. Um, so that, to me, I could write really easily in one sitting. So a riff like that that has to do with past, that has to do with the history, it's very easy for me to write. It's much harder for me to actually physically move characters through space. <laughs> Okay. Like getting them from one location to another, I tend to be overly detailed, so I have to like rip it all out later. Like I have them put one foot in front of the other, they hail a cab, they open a door, they pay the cab driver. So later I have to go back and it's like, okay, the reader gets it. Like they took a cab. That's all I needed to say. Okay. Yeah, there are um, some like four-hour so road it's trips. It's funny, this, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, but it's funny confronting those things. And you know, some things really flow and some things are easy and second nature and other things really require a sort of um, one foot in front of the other powering through and like and sometimes it feels like laying brick of this like of the great wall of china but you just keep going okay well yeah uh, you know in terms of uh history is one thing people who haven't read the book yet should probably know is that you've gone into great detail imagining cordova's filmography yes uh and every one of the you, you, you said you have plots for every one of the films everyone that, yes okay. yes They're not some i included, have actual right? no. scenes others i just have a plot point with like a, a beginning, a middle, and end. Okay. So some are more detailed than others, but I do have plots for all of them. How long did that process take you? Probably a few months. I mean, it was before I actually started writing Night Film, and I just wanted to do a lot of background and character work and figure out exactly what that world was. So when Scott, the main character, is going after Cordova and investigating this woman's death, it, 
it would just be very natural that certain scenes and snippets of dialogue and costumes just come to him in a really familiar way. And the only way to pull that off is really for it to be familiar to me as the writer. But I also, that is actually the, my favorite part of the job. And it's, it's creating those worlds from scratch and creating a body of work from nothing and, um, and what would be pervasive and mysterious to me. But I enjoyed that process. And, and how about the, the character of Scott McGrath, our, our narrator? How did he uh, come together for you? When I originally did the book proposal for Night Film, I had constructed it in a way that ended up um, materializing the book. I had all different photographs and newspaper articles, and from that way, using all of those different, that paraphernalia, it was giving a sense of what the book would be. And so I had written, I came up with the character of this investigative reporter and wrote some of his case notes. Um, and that ended up being Scott's voice. And I always thought at the time oh, it would be too much too difficult to take on a 43-year-old man's point of view. So I'm just doing it for this article and I'll probably choose something else. And I did try different points of view and I kept coming back to this reporter and I realized I wanted the challenge of writing from, from his point of view. And it ended up being a challenge, but one that I like to take on. <laughs> okay. Well, can I, can I ask more specifically, what, what were the challenges in sort of pegging how he, how he spoke on the page? Well, I think coming off of Blue um, from Special Topics, which was hyper-literate, a young adolescent voice that really, ha because she had such little life experience and because she was reading the world around her through all of, this, all of these books that she had read, it was very easy for me to write from that point of view. And any time that the plot was slowing down, I could go, I, she could riff on some fictitious book that she had read and, um, and that was sort of a bit of comic relief at, for me as the writer. But this was much more streamlined and rational. There was no place within Scott's psyche to hide because he was an investigative reporter. He, unless he'd had a mental break with reality, he was going to remain pretty much in the here and now. So it just allowed me to face certain things that I was afraid of with plot and, uh, and character. And um, it certainly required me having some of my guy friends read through it and, and make sure I <laughs> was on, at least in the ballpark of a male voice. And um, uh, I guess we should, we should turn it over? All right, yeah, great. Uh, I have no sense of time, so we'll start with your questions then. Um, so for those who are just getting started as uh, writers, can you give us an idea of what your discipline is, da daily discipline writing, and then how did you find your agent, and how did you find, get published? Of course. I believe if you're starting out as a writer, you have to write every day. And if you have another full-time job, it's just something that you have to weave into the fabric of your life w and, and be quite rigid about it. Um, I had a full-time job when I started Special Topics, and I would cram writing in any e extra space that I had. Um, because I think you have to get into the rhythm of writing and being able to write even when you don't feel like it. I think, uh, having talked to so many other writers, I think the consensus is, is that you write even on those very dry days. So I think that would be the most important thing, is that at least to write Monday through Friday, even if it's only for an hour. Um, in terms of finding my agent, I got into the habit fairly quickly of writing something and then sending it off for professional feedback. And that certainly meant getting rejected many times. And, um, but each time that I did that, there were always a handful of agents who, and I would send cold query letters basically describing my project and then they would ask to read it. Um, but in each exercise where I did that, there were always a handful of agents who really took the time to walk me through what was wrong with the manuscript. And they would also give me great encouragement of moments where they could see something. And um, I'm so indebted for that kind of response because that really is something that you can take away and keep going. Also, the major thing is to never give up, that if you want to be a published writer, it is entirely possible at any age and any time, as long as you have the discipline and the drive. So that would be my advice. Um, I, I was curious about, you said that Cordova came first, and um, 
I was curious if you started writing a book from Cordova's point of view or about Cordova and then, it, and then went back for Scott or if it was always a guy that was investigating the, myst the mysterious character. Actually, no, it never even occurred to me to write from Cordova's point of view. I think because I always saw him as an absence. I always felt his, the emptiness of his lack of presence and how powerful that was. I mean, the book is about a lack of presence in the sense and the mosaic of eyewitnesses and other characters talking about something or someone and how that gives birth to this incredible life. So I always found him as this very strong presence that was not present. Um, and that was always how I conceived him, but even though I had a very strong picture in my mind. Um, but night film is about following these crumbs and eyewitness testimonies and how the stories about other people are almost as powerful as their presence, if not more so. Um, do you want to make this into film? And if you did it as a film, what kind of character would the, the lead be? Like the guy, what would he look like? That's an interesting question. It has been optioned by Peter Chernin through 20th Century Fox. Uh, but I, as a writer, I have a specific view of each character in my mind. And it doesn't have anything to do with a celebrity. It's just, um, it's a private incarnation really for me and I think that that's one of the joys of reading is allowing readers to conceive what characters look like themselves so I'm leaving that entirely in the hands of the filmmakers and um, I mean if they do ask me I do say I would like John Hamm to audition really badly so maybe John Hamm for Scott but um, other than that <laughs> other than that I'm open-minded. I was wondering how much of character development do you do for each character? Like you said you liked for Cordova the absence of it, or his like presence being in his absence, but do you have a whole life that you know about him? Like you know why he's I this do. mysterious person and each character when you develop them, like how much do you know their entire life story? I know quite a bit. Um, I had actually conceived Cordova's entire life history. I knew who his mother was. I knew who his father was. But as I was t saying before, I really love that process. I have a notebook that I work with, which is basically my Bible for the book, where I scrawl everything um, in terms of these character histories. So not only for Cordova and all of his wives and, um, and jobs that he had had in, as a teenager. So I, I certainly like to do all of that work. And often for my main characters as well, Scott, Nora, and Hopper. Um, I just like to have that background so it's very fluid. And certainly you don't always use it, but just having it there grounds you in a sense of reality for you as the writer, that these people seem real to you. And then you can just take off and um, whether or not you ever go into any of that backstory, you probably won't. But I think just having it there pervades the page and, and just gives it this sense of reality. Hello. Hi. Um, I know you were talking about you took a uh, class at NYFA. Yes. Um, and you got that whole experience. Um, I was wondering, um, did you ever write a screenplay? And um, would you ever consider doing a screenplay? Um, because I think you're, the, the process of how you describe you went about this book is sort of like the same format in writing a screenplay. And I think like your ideas would be you know, very, very incredible for that. So. Certainly, I have written a screen. I have written two screenplays. Um, I think every novelist like has to try that at least once, uh, and I think that each story that you end up being captivated by like will find its own medium. But I mean, I am a novelist at my heart. I think I like the ability to create and not have anything between me and releasing work. Um, and immediately having a dialogue with readers and fans, I think. Um, but I mean, of course, I love film and, um, t and television, and there are so many diverse ways now to tell a story. And all of those boundaries between each medium are really changing now, so it's quite exciting in terms of being a writer and a content creator, because um, 
an ability to move between the medium. It just seems um, really possible now. But for me, I like to create a world and allow it to immediately, without having to have a gigantic production budget, really find an audience. So I think um, in that sense, I'm a novelist, first and foremost. But we'll see what happens in the future. And was that all? I guess that was all we had time for, right? That was so, it. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. Appreciate thank it. you guys so much for coming. Thank you, Marisha, for 